artificial intelligence from within our existing system will destroy us. We quite potentially could end all life on the planet. We've never reset a currency regime when we had nuclear weapons, but that artificial intelligence will continue. It will continue to get better and better. It's an exponential trend you can see what's happened even this year if you just look at gpd open open ai stable diffusion look what's happening this year and people are, are asleep at the wheel on, on what's what's happening final little rapid fire question do you think we're living in a simulation so welcome back to the podcast everyone i hope you're having a good day and today i'm thrilled because i'm joined with a man who needs no introduction jeff booth welcome to the podcast uh, thanks for having me luke it's an absolute pleasure. So you have written probably one of the most thought-provoking books in the Bitcoin space, but it doesn't just touch on Bitcoin. You talk about many of these big picture ideas like artificial intelligence, macroeconomics, geopolitics, and all sorts of other things. So Jeff, I'm sure the listener would love to learn how you kind of built that really broad knowledge base and was able to tie all of these concepts together in one book and maybe just Give us a little bit of a background of what you were doing before you wrote The Price of Tomorrow. So I've, I've always been a technology or I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, and then as I saw uh, the web or internet evolve, I, I, I wanted to be a technology entrepreneur. So built businesses and, uh, and continue to serve on boards and largely in technology companies. Um, the, the path to kind of finding some of these bigger picture things that were were broken was just probably from looking more at first principles everywhere. I've always questioned, I've always questioned the world in which I live in, how I show up in that world, what ends up and constantly asking probably bigger questions. Um, and that's, that's actually served me. Sometimes they lead to dead ends and you, uh, and sometimes they lead to insights that, maybe some other people that haven't haven't explored yet and many very important insights that we're going to touch on today i think probably the most important one is uh just deflation and how deflation should be making things cheaper and today everybody thinks it's normal that prices continue to go up forever so maybe jeff that gives us a good place for you to maybe just give the listener who hasn't read uh, the price of tomorrow a little 5 minute tldr or synopsis um of the the book that you uh, wrote in 2020 was that when you published it yeah i wrote, wrote it in 2018 2019 published at the beginning of 2020 so yeah. but but it it largely predicts where we are today in in our economic world and where we're going as well um and 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 the it's an synopsis of the book or thesis of that book was technology is deflationary. Um, essentially, productivity is deflationary. And we invent things to solve problems. And we call it those inventions now technology. A lot of those things are technology enabled. Um, and that technology rate is moving exponentially. It's moving very, very fast today, not linear, uh, linearly, exponentially. And that productivity should, all things being equal, um, reduce prices so that we work less. Um, and and human, human beings should benefit out of all of that productivity flowing, uh, flowing to them in the form of lower prices. That's what would happen in a free market. But we don't live in a free market. We live in a market that is manipulated to try to pay back debt that is growing exponentially on the other side to be able to stop the, the deflation from happening and that exponentially growing debt or manipulation of money now turning into inflation that's uh is essentially stealing the productivity from from us and transferring that productivity to very few people um and, and so two systems are colliding against each other and that's and and the existing system, if it it allowed the if it allowed deflation, what would happen is all the debt would would reset. It would be unrepayable today. We had, let's call it four hundred trillion dollars of global debt that cannot be repaid. It's impossible to repay that, so it has to be manipulated and and pretend you could pay it back through a higher inflation rate or manipulation of money. 
A hundred percent. That's a, a, a big takeaway. I really want to double click on today that you articulate in obviously the book, the price of tomorrow and your article, the, the greatest game is the fact that the current monetary system is absolutely unsustainable and there is no way out. They're going to have to continue printing at an exponential rate. And uh, we're just going to be left picking up the, the ashes of the burning fiat system. Yeah. But if you, if you carry on, if that happened, and that's the that's the thing. That's actually why I wrote one of the chapters in in uh, in the book called "Us Versus Them." Mm. Um, and because if you continue to do that, essentially, if you have theft in 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 base money, um, and then then the emergent complex behavior of society is based on that theft. What would the emergent complex uh, behavior of society look like? And it would look like a lot of that. The the top leaders would look like that people who are best at stealing would look like that and it would have to steal more and more over time and it to to be able to do that it would have to pit society against society typically when that happens is you get elected by 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 creating a a, a group that is the evil group against your group and then to retain power you have to create a bigger enemy outside of your borders. So to, when when the world goes through this, the world typically resets uh, a currency crisis like this or a global debt yeah, crisis like this um, in, through war. Um, in this time, speaking of a positive side, this time um, Bitcoin can prevent that if enough people start to choose to be able to to move over and build the bridge to a new parallel system that's building along uh, that 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 works exactly opposite to the existing system, um, and it and it's moving it's moving in parallel. What's actually happening is Bitcoin is repricing the existing entire existing system, mm -hmm. rather than what most people think is happening, is they're pricing Bitcoin through the error code of the existing system. That's a big mistake a lot of people make when they're looking at new emergent technologies. They put in their recency bias and they're kind of measuring this new technology with the framework or with the lens of the old system. That's another big point you always click on that I really enjoy. But just because you mentioned that the chapter in the book, Us Versus Them, I really wanted to ask you in this discussion um, about that chapter in particular because it predicted a lot of the political division and societal division that we're seeing that has exploded since 2020 we've got the left versus right uh movements we have and on both sides of the left and the right people are becoming more polarized and more extreme and a point that you made in the book that i personally hadn't thought about until i read it in the book uh, was people will choose to uh, look at a people problem as opposed to a system problem. I think I, I, I regurgitated that in the, the wrong way around. But Jeff, could you maybe just um, explain the difference between people problem and system problems? Yeah, and and this is uh, there's a theme throughout humanity's evolution that would look at this too. Why we why we look at, instead of the core thing in religions, we look at the the, the religious person. We want to find a hero. And we want to celebrate the hero, or we want to find a villain and and and, and demonize the, the villain. It's much easier for us to 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 fall for somebody who we believe and they are going to fix everything for us, or they're the or they're the enemy, than believe that the the problem is deeper than that, and it's a system problem that gives rise to those things. And that's something most people really fall prey to. I myself. Over the years before Bitcoin used to think that, you know, voting in uh, the orange man, Donald Trump would fix a lot of the solutions with the system. But it doesn't matter who you vote in left or right. The the system is broken. They're going. Yeah. To so, so and just to double click on what you just said, said, if if the system would it would. So if you just said, said a free market, the existing debt. So the U.S. Let's just use the U.S. Forget about the rest of the world for a moment. The U.S. has a, a debt to GDP of about one hundred and thirty percent, and that's the that's not unfunded liabilities like pensions and everything else. That's just the the, uh, the known debt to GDP without all of the the um, the, the the liabilities are, that are unfunded. Um, if you 
stopped printing for any time. And we're going to see this experiment pay, play out in, 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 in the next probably six months because the Fed is going to be forced to either do, to do something. But uh, um, then you then tax receipts are going to go down because jobs are going to be lost and is going to ca has a, have a cascading failure because those tax receipts can't fund even to existing can't fund the 130 percent uh, debt to GDP. You need, need more and more deficit spending each year to be able to keep up the illusion of growth. And once that starts to cascade and the debt fails, you'd have a cascading collapse of everything if left unchecked, including banks and everything. The entire economy rests on that debt being solvent, and it isn't solvent. So a free market would mean the debt would collapse, and anybody who held the debt would be wiped out to zero. The problem is all of the banks and everybody's every what people believe is safe is that debt and 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 the government is made up of that debt and everything is made up of that debt so it it's it, and so people are there's an illusion of safety because and that illusion of safety rests on a simple fact that that people it, it, it think it's safe because somebody can press a button and manipulate their money more mm -hmm. Right, which is which is crazy. That but that is the economy we live in, and it's nothing. It's nothing like a free market. So so that means that productivity needs to be, must be continually stolen from society, and concentrated in few hands until that breaks. And we're watching a break uh, before our eyes. Our good friend Greg Foss says it's only maths. It's grade eleven maths, ladies and gentlemen. And you mentioned the one hundred and thirty percent debt to GDP figure. Um, I think Hirschman Capital did some very nice work on sovereign nations and their defaults uh, since eighteen hundred. So for anyone who hasn't read that Hirschman Capital report, I believe fifty one out of fifty two sovereign nations who have reached that one hundred and thirty percent debt to GDP have ended up defaulting on their debt within 15 years of them reaching that 130% Rubicon. And that's where we are around the world. It's not just yep. the US. The, on, the, the only one that hasn't yet is Japan mm -hmm. and it will, right? So they all will. And look at the Japanese yen today. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> They're going for a currency crisis as we speak. Yep. Uh, yep. So I think we've definitely hit on the macro uh, to start this uh, discussion off, Jeff. I would love to maybe pivot the conversation into technology. So we've talked about how pivotal technology is at making society, uh, well, cheaper to live. Uh, technology should be making things cheaper to live. But technology is also at the core of, you know, our civilization's evolution. Uh, you have a very interesting quote. I think it might have been in the price of tomorrow and it really made me think but you said something along the lines of error correction has been well, error correction is at the heart of uh, our civilization our civilization's intelligence sorry so obviously homo sapiens humans we've been the smartest being on this planet for the past couple of hundred thousand or maybe million odd years now but with the rise of artificial intelligence, things could be changing in the not too distant future and we may not be at the top of the food chain. So maybe before we get into AI, maybe we can just talk about error correction and how technological inventions like the printing press uh, hyper, hyper, hyper accelerate our civilization's uh, intelligence. Okay, those are two. Uh, they're connected, but they're two kind of. Uh, I'm going to start in a different place if you're, if that's okay. So oh, please! They, I just uh, threw a lot at you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Ajay Agarwal, who uh, who uh, quoted, who wrote a quote in that book or covering that book, is uh, is a professor of economics at Rotman and also uh, one of the lead uh, researchers and or uh, people in in artificial intelligence. Very connected, and. When he read the book, it, the one thing that stood out for him is my quote, that quote that you just said, that human intelligence, error correction is human intelligence. That error correction is intelligence, period, is what computers do, is what we do. And mapping the mind to computers, how that works, is a lot of what's going on to try to figure out how to make computers as smart as we are. So that those, 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 those fields are merging 
to be able to understand some of the top computer scientists or kind of brain scientists as well. They start starting to take those research that, that research together. Um, but if you look at what you do to gain expertise in anything, right, and and use use learning to talk, learning a new language, learning to walk, uh, you in learning to walk, you fall down a bunch of times. And you just keep on, you keep on getting up and you keep on walking. And if you do that enough times, you get better and better and better. And you don't even think about it, it was a learned response. It was something learned at first. That's the same thing that our entire society does. And we learn on top of, we stand on the shoulders of other people who went before us and created greatness before us. And, and, and those things move faster and faster and faster. So it's no wonder if you just bucket when we say technology is moving exponentially, you could just say intelligence, the global intelligence is moving, doesn't feel like it every day these days, <laughs> but uh, is moving exponentially um, faster because we're standing on the shoulders of greatness that went before us. And we're trying to find ways to free our time. We're trying to find ways to solve problems and to free our time. And, and there's another, this is where I, I, come back at this in a different thing. If I look through kind of evolution through human history, um, and uh, uh, three kind of, kind of three parts, we are energy, storage, um, and, and, uh, and compute. And human beings have limited energy, limited storage, and limited compute. When we connect ourselves together, we have way more compute. Right. So, so, so Dunbar's law, power of 150 in villages before when those, when those 150 villages, villagers would connect themselves together through trust, they could get a lot more done. If you had high trust in any sort of society and you were connected, what that meant, what that meant is you were connected and you could trust somebody else would do their job and you could do your job. And you could separate the division through the division of labor and get more from for everybody. Everybody wins in that. And and so, but if you break those three components apart, energy, storage, and, and compute, then then giant, then giant um progresses or leaps forward would happen throughout humanity anytime any one of those moved. And if, if all three of them moved, then you would, you could remake society, but let's use, let's use energy as, as we found higher forms of energy, you could say the British empire was built on coal, right? A higher form of energy. And the British empire started to lose the British empire as the U S empire found oil, a higher form of energy, right? Because what that higher form of energy did is it made more storage and more compute and it, and it, it made things you, you could do more with what you had. And so it gave, it gave an advantage. The printing press gave way, it broke open st uh, storage. So been, before the printing press, we couldn't store our ideas. And so now every, it, it did two things. We could store our ideas. So it opened up a whole bunch of people who could then store their ideas. And furthermore, it created a bunch of people who could back check, was that idea correct and build upon that idea. Before that, you'd have to trust um, a, a church to pass down ideas, um, ideas from your, from your grandfather to father, to, but, but th those ideas would lose, uh, th they, would, they would lose some of their meaning through the translation. And and the and the written word or the printing press allowed them to to not lose as much fidelity or information. So that expanded. That there was another one of those huge expansions of both contributing to and um, and looking back and having way more information and in storage. And then all of the people, all of our minds connected to those things, would be able to compute um, and and add more ideas faster and the more minds connected. And that's one of the things that I, where I, I make a really tight 
connection in in if you don't have sound money so or if you don't have trust is probably a better way of saying it which requires sound money um then the compute breaks down because people don't trust each other so you don't have that global supercomputer us working on top of it and so today where we are in more energy so so you could say we are on an ever, never ending search as us as, as human beings for higher forms of energy storage and compute and today where we are is we're finding higher forms of energy storage and compute that are now in computers that eventually will outpace us mm. Right. Where we are on that, you could argue some people, it, it scares people and it scares people primarily, I think, because what they're, what they're most worried, you, you mentioned something before you said a recency bias, what they're most worried about, they can't pay their bills today. And so what they're going into, and they can't pay their bills today because we have manipulation and money. That's, that's essentially that, that inflation is wage deflation. So you're paying people less and less and less in real terms. And they're having a harder and harder time to keep up. And, and so they can't pay their bills. And then they're worried about, wait, the artificial intelligence is going to come along and take my job. So I would need to make more before that happens. And they make that worse. And they elect leaders who, instead of understanding that we're in a system change from one system to uh, that required or we built a system that we required expanding debt and, and required inflation to pay back debt that couldn't be repaid. And we're moving into a system that allows prices to fall. Um, they're stuck in the existing system, scared to death about robotics and artificial intelligence and what ends up happening. Um, and, and instead of moving to, instead of understanding a system that would allow that productivity, those productivity gains to enrich their lives. So Bitcoin is the latter. Bitcoin is a system that will allow those productivity gains to enrich people's lives. Um, but most people are stuck in that former system. And that's just all due to the recency bias. Um, that yeah. when, when, when you said that on a podcast, uh, the global supercomputer uh, quote, that idea about us being a, you know, storage compute and looking for higher forms of energy that was really pivotal for myself i've been looking into a lot about uh what actually caused the industrial revolution in the 17th in the 1770s because after reading the sovereign individual i was kind of shocked when you look back throughout human history that for 10,000 years we were pretty much just living in farms you know toiling away living in farms living under kings and queens in these kind of monarchy and all of a sudden in 250 years we got transported out of farms into these big cities in the industrial revolution and i was kind of i've been thinking about it for a while and just when you when you mentioned that i think it might have been a podcast i'm not sure if you've yeah. uh, written about it yeah i think i i think i mentioned it on peter mccormick's podcast and preston pish's podcast on, uh, i mentioned it on both of those um furthermore though if you just kind of play that forward on on those cities um it's actually the the centralization of energy is required to make the city work mm. um and and what you have today with bitcoin is you're having a decentralized and and so the centralization of energy has to choose which energy um to to make the grid work and they have to cut it off cut off energy that would push prices too low to make that 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 to uh, that that balance work for cities so that centralization actually creates uh, uh, creates risk into a system an energy an energy system and it doesn't look for innovation within an energy system except for to manage the centralization and so it ends up but but everybody thinks that's working really well and everybody races to the cities because there's more us connected more compute <laughs> Uh, more stability and energy and everything else and what's happening today is you could especially with bitcoin mining you're decentralizing energy and your innovation in energy is going up is going to go up as a result and you could with starlink bitcoin mining you could be anywhere in the world and plug into the internet 
and 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 connect and connect to anybody in the world and not what well, you're in El Salvador right now I'm in Vancouver do you, it, nobody needs to be in a city anymore to be able to do what we're doing which is very different than the last 50 years 20 years 100 years is very different so all of these things are moving faster and faster today and I just, I just, when you were mentioning Bitcoin there, I just kind of had a mini epiphany then. So what do, what do they say about the normal human brain? We only use about 10 or 20% of our human brain. It's something like that anyway. And I think like all of the progress that we've seen in the past 250 years from, you know, using coal as an energy source to using oil as an energy source to uh, creating and inventing steam engines, electricity, steel, the automobile and the microprocessor, all of that technological in innovation that we've seen in the past 250 years, it's all been built off of a flawed system where only 10 or 20% of this global supercomputer is even connected to the system because we have so much intellectual capital in Africa and in Latin America that's just not connected to the system. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin walks into the equation and it can fundamentally change everything. This is where I kind of wanted to take the conversation next. How does Bitcoin play into maybe how we reimagine governance structures and where we locate ourselves around the world, Jeff? <laughs> Just that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But but it, but it, uh, this is a Bitcoin podcast, so I'm sure most of the people here are listening are Bitcoiners. Um, so they'll already know this. They'll already know some of the things uh, uh, that I've said uh, uh, said on podcast. But it, it's such a 180 from the existing system. It's actually why when when we talk about going down the rabbit hole, that you get to the bottom of the rabbit hole and you know it's true. You know it's based on, you know it's unstoppable and it's expanding, it's decentralized, more secure. And the system that, it, that we're moving to operates 180% different than the system we live in. So in the existing system, you take on more debt, you take on uh, school loans, you take on the entire thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger because of that more debt making those 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 system uh, systems bigger um and you do that largely because you know the debt you're going to pay repay with cheaper dollars tomorrow right because inflation is baked into that system and the and the debt you take on the, it is going to be repaid in cheaper dollars tomorrow bitcoin works the exact opposite way the debt gets more expensive so, so it's repricing. That's why I say it's repricing that system. So you, you, the way you make more money in Bitcoin is you, instead of rent seeking and, and sitting, uh, sitting on top of, uh, top of other people applying more debt so that they're in essentially perpetual slavery, working harder and harder, you're providing value to people. And the output of that value is giving you more value in Bitcoin. But the output of that on a second uh, a, a second degree is bringing all prices down for all of society. So, so the irony is you could hate Bitcoin. You could hate it. You could be one of the people that's... To and it will still serve you well because it's going to decrease your, your, your prices of living. Um, that's going to take some time to play out, but they're totally different systems. And people are early into Bitcoin right now um, at least that are deep and really done a bunch of work on this, probably like yourself, are are starting to understand this, at, at or understand that how different it is, and how different that is. So, what does that look like in political? Uh, what does that look like for politics? What does it look like for how cities are? How does it look? It um, there's dramatic changes coming that'll happen slowly. But um, but those 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 changes are effectively mean we're building an emergent complex behavior based on truth rather than rather than uh, rather than a fraud. And so, what would society look like if the emergent complex behavior of all global trade, our supercomputer, was based on truth? And that supercomputer, the the output of that supercomputer, made us was able to make our lives better as a result of freeing our time so we could spend our time more efficiently on things that we wanted to spend our time in. 
And so that's where we are going and it's going to take some time to get there, but that's where, uh, that's where we're going. And, and it, I often say this too, we wouldn't vote for Bitcoin. I, so if it, if it wasn't built this way, like if a politicians, if a politician said, we wouldn't vote for the idea behind Bitcoin. Cause if a politician said, um, Hey, we're spending too much. We can't, uh, we're, we're broke. And that means everything has to fail. Um, elect me. Yeah, that's the truth. That is the truth. Would you vote for that person? And I would, I would virtually said that person would probably get 0.5% of votes yeah. versus the politician that lies to everybody and says, don't worry, we can pay everything that you want and give you more, more money. Um, that politician gets elected because we want to believe the cozy little lie that we have a free lunch. And it's not a free lunch. And so that's what's happening to society. One day that free lunch, you really do need to pay for that free lunch and governments who just endlessly print money and hand it out to whatever part of society they deem most marginalized at any specific time, all of that accumulated debt that, you know, governments spend, eventually you need to pay for it. And you mentioned their timing, Jeff. I can't remember if this was in the book or one of your great articles, but you mentioned uh, a, a physics or an engineering problem that was related to sand and how when you reach a critical point or an inflection point where there's so much sand on a sand pile, you don't know which grain of sand is going to cause the whole thing to completely melt down and topple. So maybe I think you might know what I'm talking about because I really don't. Yeah. So Yeah, the, no, no. So 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 um the the economy or your body or your mind is a nonlinear system. And and but most people treat it as a linear system. And if you're looking at a non-linear system, you have to understand chaos theory and you have to understand how that uh, how that plays. And the chaos theory is that you can't understand all of the different interconnections and what tiny little changes here would lead uh, lead to as a result of the chaos. The example of the sand pile game is if you drop a sand uh, on a sand pile game, it'll reach a critical state where the next Sand, a piece of sand would drop and take down in an, in an avalanche sand uh, pile. Now that critical state could happen at 10 grains of sand or a thousand grains of sand or, or five, 5,000 grains of sand. And anytime you're watching the, it, it fail, you say, ah, there was that grain of sand. But if you couldn't know what grain of sand caused it, if it was 10, 5,000 or what, then, then you would never know what grain of sand that's a, that's, uh, chaos theory same thing which snowflake causes the avalanche and it's a build-up of all of the, these things and that's where we are in the global economy right now we have an unstable system that's ga ga great at ga gaining more and more instability and people are trying to to think this is the answer to the unstable system and that's going to, to create stability there's nothing that's going to that is going to create stability in that unstable system it's going to be a new system that is that is changing that system from outside the system yeah that was when you mentioned that in a podcast that really got the light bulb turning on in my uh, thick mind because that that's exactly what we we're talking about earlier in the discussion in terms of debt once you reach or you breach that rubicon of 130 percent debt to gdp history tells you that since the year 1800 most governments end up defaulting on that debt and today in the 2020s, it's kind of looking as if these, you know, countries and sovereign nations around the world that used to be aligned in, uh, let's say, global peace or in times of globalization, a lot of these countries around the world seem to cooperate. But it looks as if maybe in the 2020s, countries are opting out of the current system. So for anyone who doesn't know, the US dollar is the global reserve currency. And for the past 80 or so years, countries all around the world have agreed that we're going to price energy in US dollars and that's the way the system is countries who tried to opt out of that system like iraq and libya obviously things didn't go too well for them because the u.s was you know defending its global reserve uh, status but today we've got the brics nations so brazil russia india 
China and South Africa are all trying to opt out of using a US dollar-led reserve currency. And they recently announced earlier this year they want to create their own global reserve currency. So maybe this would be a great place to jump into uh, the geopolitics of what's unfolding with the United States, uh, trying to maintain, you know, their grip on the global reserve currency and maybe how that could be impacting or influencing their decisions when it comes to monetary policy like interest rates. Yeah, so Luke, an interesting thing about that question is both both you and I, I think you wrote an article for Bitcoin Magazine talking about there's potential of the US actually going into Bitcoin um, uh, 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 as a primary reserve. Um, and I came to the same conclusion uh, I, I can't remember which podcast that I that I talked about it on first, but uh, some time ago, that the, the, the it's a higher probability than people think that mm-hmm. the U.S. actually moves into Bitcoin, because the world needs a neutral reserve currency, so that uh, so that labor rates aren't artificially uh, pushed down by governments kind of manipulating the currencies, and then because of that creating a way for um, trade tariffs to protect different industries in different different countries. So this manipulation is hitting hitting a time where you if you argued the other side of this uh, of this argument and said has the ha, has the US dollar system bring, brought kind of abundance to the world or or not abundance to the world but but more people into a system and brought them out of poverty you could probably argue, yes, the world was better off uh, today for a large portion of the world. Now, um, it also devastated devastates people in South America and Africa. Um, but the, that that trade bringing China on, online, kind of that codependency, one is the exporter, one is the one's the buyer, created a, uh, created um, a world that brought a brought a lot of people out of poverty. But now, where we are into this uh, into the system, so with a with a strong dollar and other with with you say China is the exporter of the world, um, and the U.S. is the buyer of the world. Um, and when China, China is buying most of the things, China is buying are raw, raw raw materials or commodities to be able to be the exporter of the world. So even when you look at the trade balance, that's where the most of the most of the purchases are going. Um, that trade that trade balance the global sum trade balance has to be zero all over the all over the world there has to be buyers and there has to be sellers and for a long time when china would would essentially buy us bonds to keep keep rates low it would be looking like and that and that allowed us to have high labor rates it needed high debt and to be able to do that and china would you could say acted like vendor financing. We're going to give you fine. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to uh, give you vendor financing, keep your, keep rates low um, and you'll buy our stuff. And that codependency that created a world where China grew and the U S grew uh, um, as a result, both people seem to be winning, but now we're at a time where, where China to keep going. That means, you us cannot onshore critical industry uh critical industry with the high cost of labor uh, with the high cost of labor unless they did it with trade barriers um and because companies will find workarounds to 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 move just because because a system is about money we'll try to find workarounds to 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 source where labor is the lowest rate or where they can get where they can uh, they can make products for cheaper. And so that system that actually once benefited the US now no longer benefits the US because the same thing now you have a geopolitical risk an adversary who's grown very strong that that many of your critical components to your supply chains and critical industries are made there. Um, and there's no way to move that um, uh, f- uh, without a neutral reserve currency, so so I could imagine China wanting um, gold, so they could play the same trick that the, the that happened before 
as they say, and 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 move uh, uh, to, uh, to gold, and they could create a new currency regime around gold, and then 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 a Chinese yuan. I can't imagine the rest of the world going along with it, um, um, and and more so, I think that with Bitcoin emerging, it's it's the best way for for the U.S. to say to Africa and, and South America, this is a this is a better for, this is a better form, and it becomes checkmate for China because Bitcoin acts as a is it, Bitcoin is a capitalist system. Right, it's a it's a it's a free market system. It is not a command and control centralized socialist system like China. So it's really hard for China to advocate for Bitcoin and keep a state power over uh, over everybody uh, over everyone. So it, it feels like it feels like well, not a certainty that a higher a higher probability um, and and probably a higher probability than people actually uh, give credit. I think it's actually the only thing. I think it's the only thing that'll keep uh, that 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 extends the life of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. Um, it doesn't doesn't keep it forever, but it extends yeah. the life of it, and it keep and 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 U.S. Uh, U.S. benefits more than other nations if they do it soon enough. That's how I see it as well. You, you mentioned the a big piece there. Uh, obviously, gold gold's a massive one. So Russia right now is supposed to be an enemy of the United States. I believe the ruble, uh, that fiat currency, is the most quote unquote backed. If you actually look at the amount of gold reserves Russia has, and you if you look at the circulation of the Russian ruble, so Russia has a lot of gold. China has a lot of gold. If you look at their imports and exports over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, you can come to some very interesting conclusions that maybe China is lying about their official gold holdings and they're actually sitting on like 20,000 metric tons. So I, I like the biggest pushback I get when I say the dollar could be backed by Bitcoin is they'll back it with gold first. And like, like you said, Jeff, like, you know, China and Russia uh, like they have a lot of gold. So I, don't, I just don't see the US backing the dollar with gold and strengthening its competitors. Yeah, either do I. And, and and if you just, you just, the thing you just said, how much gold does China have? How much gold does any of these nations actually have? Mm. In, a, in a world with very little trust, how could you audit that? Right. Exactly. So how could you actually make that? How could you actually find out and build to build a, a system that back on a hard currency like gold? And I I don't want to throw. It's not. It's not a zero probability event that that's a step function on the way to Bitcoin. Mm. Um. Uh, but I consider it a lower probability event just because of what would actually happen and need to happen to revalue. Um. Uh, to gold well bitcoin's moving faster and faster and bitcoin is benefiting from a network effect um and it now is what on layer two is building on a network effect on top of the network effect that takes the takes the power out of individual nations and puts the power in each of us each of our hands so as we trade more and more and more and more people are saying uh, you know i use the example of often we're in this system and we're walking across a bridge. And as we're walking across the bridge to the other side of a new system, we're, we're building that bridge stronger and stronger for every other human to walk across that bridge. That's what's happening with Bitcoin. And what's coming in that system, because it is the free market and because there's so much value to be built on top of it, is going to bring on first hundreds of millions and then billions of people to that system where they decide. We all decide instead of this opaque government structure that decides for us. Yeah. We decide. And so remember back earlier in the interview, I said, what would we vote for? And we would vote to have our life, our, our way of life continue, even if it's based on a lie. Yeah. We want to bury our head in the sand. We don't want to hear the truth. And so, so, the, the government that we say it's those evil people in government is that the government is us. We choose. If we choose a different path, one that equals truth, abundance, uh, hope for a better future. If enough people choose that, 
that is the new path. There is no government control over us. It's just it's just us. And, and that is a really important, uh, it's really important on both sides. Understanding how much you, not me, you, every single person, through their actions is reinforcing the existing system they live in. I need to make more money. I need to, my, my investment returns have to equal this. So I have enough money to escape the system and retire with enough money. Everything they're doing, more and more of that, their energy, their utiles of energy in their human body are spending, <laughs> building the world that they don't want to see. Well, they spend more of those utiles of energy yelling at other people doing the exact same thing in the existing system. Well, this new system is building, building in parallel. They could just spend more of their time in the new system. And if they saw what's happening in the new system and all the building that's happening there and what is coming, they would be, they'll, just by seeing it, you want to spend more time in it because you can see what's, you can see the transition. It is such a stark contrast uh, going out to, say, a nightclub and hanging out with who some of the people that I may call from time to time a normie and then going to a Bitcoin conference and talking to an individual who's orange-pilled or Bitcoin. The difference is so stark and so different. that it, It's an amazing... Uh, once people do see this, the new system, it's very hard to go back to the old system and in, and enjoy what you used to enjoy and do what you used to do before finding Bitcoiners. It's why no one will sell Bitcoin. It's why yeah. we don't we don't think about it as in and, and it's not a religion, but it's but if if you've done the work on it, you understand why this uh, why this is inevitable, mm. and it's moving and it's aligned with the best in us. It's a which we wouldn't naturally do. We would we would try to find a system that would benefit us more than other people, mm. and 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 having to comply with a system that benefits all of us. Once you see that and you see what it stands for, when, um, you could call it a religion if you want to, but once you see what it, uh, it stands for, it's why people won't sell. Like it just, it, I've joked around uh, in different times, but people don't have to worry about this going to zero because I'll buy it all. Um, yeah, because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not selling forever. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's an idea. H holding yeah. Bitcoin is an idea of separating money from state. I will not fund war by holding dollars and paying tax to a government who's sending money all around the world to do very mean and terrible things. We, they, well, that could be a whole other podcast in and of itself. Um, and obviously, the, the the only vote that really counts is voting with your money, stepping yeah, across yeah. that bridge. Yeah, and and then and once you're in that system, then you see a whole, whole bunch of like-minded people building on top of that system and you see and and you see that that's that's why i just i pinch myself in what i get to see and the entrepreneurs i get to back with as we started that fund ego death capital so i get to see a whole bunch of the entrepreneurs in this space i get to see what they're building and 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 you get really excited for what's to come on a system um that doesn't exist yet so people that are looking outside when you say normies that are looking outside and to understand Bitcoin, they're trying to pay their own bills. They're trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to buy it, and they're stuck into a system. And to spend all the time for them to be able to understand the the nuance and what this means, some of them just aren't there yet. So I just I just understand where we are in the system. But some of the changes, what's being built on top, will give them value in a different way. That'll just all of a sudden the light will go on, and they won't even know. They won't even know when it changed. Tell us more about Ego Death Capital and what was the genesis for starting that? It was the genesis was actually what we just talked about. The genesis was was I I had, I was accumulating Bitcoin. Um, I, the um, I was talking about Bitcoin, teaching teaching Bitcoin, spending a lot of my time on how the systems were different and. I wanted to spend more of my time in the ecosystem and build building. You could say it was selfish. I wanted to spend more of the time building the world I wanted to see rather than talking about the world I saw. <laughs> and, and so this gave me an opportunity to be able to, uh, to raise some capital from, uh, from LPs who shared a similar vision of, of where this is going. 
um, and then put together uh, put together a team um, to be able to to essentially back the best entrepreneurs or people that we that we thought were building really cool um, layer two three technologies on top of Bitcoin. I love it. I've been following what you guys are doing, uh, building on top of Lightning and following a lot of the developments like Taro. And uh, it's very, very interesting. Fetty Mints as well. Like I think people who question why Bitcoiners are Bitcoin maximalists, I don't think they're paying attention to what's being built at these higher layers on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. And 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 just if you just said that, it, I, I, you've used this example a couple of times in different podcasts. So my apologies to anybody who, who's heard it before, but I I've always been able to I've been really good at predicting the future or different different things um, that's kind of uh, that, that are coming throughout my life. I've been really good at that's been uh, a skill set, and yet that same person, I, if you asked me in two thousand six or two thousand seven, what I can whatever year that I think the iPhone came out in two thousand eight, if you asked me just before the iPhone came out, whether I would have ever used the iPhone. And I would say, no chance. I love my BlackBerry. The buttons are great. There's no way I'm going to use the digital, the, the, the interface on a screen with the, with these apps. And yet when I was put in my hand, I I changed my mind instantly. And so 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 when we say say when you say people can't see what what's coming with Fetty or with what's coming with some of these other things, they can't see it because it doesn't exist yet. But but for me, I've gotten to see where it is right now, kind of pre <laughs> it's it, 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 it coming out. I've gotten to see and and when you see what's coming, you think, wow, <laughs> it's just a step function to and and hopefully. Things like that uh, show up like the iPhone did for us, um, and change a whole bunch of people's mind because it's so intuitive and it makes so much uh, so much sense. So when you're when you're able to build, they won't all win. Uh, not all every company um, that we back will win. Not every, but we wouldn't be backing them unless we thought they they had um, extraordinary opportunity to create real value for society for 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 themselves, company and society in general. Yeah, it's pretty amazing what's going on. I had the pleasure of having dinner with Obi and Eric Yates here in El Salvador a couple of months ago, and I walked away from that two-hour dinner conversation with Obi, and I was very orange-pilled on Taro and what he's doing at Fetty Mints. It's very exciting stuff. Yeah, really exciting. Jeff, I don't think you ever need to apologize for repeating yourself on podcasts. I think sometimes it takes you or me in particular hearing the same thing two or three or four times before it actually clicks in your mind. And I had that kind of epiphany uh, with some one of the things you used to say about climate change and how the existing system does not have a fix for climate change. Maybe you could walk through the listener uh, how Bitcoin and how a new system could actually help save the planet if it is, in fact, in crisis mode. Yeah, um, funny that you just said said that, because Preston said that to me. He said that you're looking at it from such a high abstraction level and people are inside the system, so it's just a totally different perception. Mm -hmm. but, but being in technology... I see that the, the so the rise of the exponential debt is actually to stop the technology from the technology is reducing price so would reduce price so fast everywhere that that you have to you have to artificially stimulate economies to be able to try to create jobs when it, ironically those things are moving exactly in opposite directions so in other words you have to pay people less at a faster and faster rate to pretend the jobs are going to be there when they're moving away anyways. And so what I could see, what I could see from every technology company I was dealing with across many different verticals from energy to, to, uh, to agriculture, to, uh, to many different uh, artificial intelligence and a number of different companies. Um, what, what I could see is if that company was successful, then what they would have done is displaced another company that created value in a different way. And they did it by effectively over time, reducing labor by, by making things more efficient. Now that, that one company's jobs went up and grew really fast. 
didn't account for the jobs it destroyed in the existing industry. And for a while, what would happen is the existing industry would uh, would persist those jobs until that company failed, right? You'd have a cask. So it, for for a while, you'd have two. You'd have a you could double count jobs because you'd have new jobs being created in one industry, and the legacy jobs that were going to go away in another. But as the new company took off, that product that productivity gain. Right? Here's a here's a easy way to see it. So yeah. my first company for the, uh, the, the, the $5 million we spent on, on technology is free today, completely free. And it's way better technology today than the 5 million we, we spent that 5 million was a whole bunch of jobs for years to be able to create that technology that was cutting edge that is now today free for anybody to use. So that's, what's happening. That's, it's it's removing those jobs and it's just it's uh, it's 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 driving that productivity uh, that productivity. Now, if the only way that that uh, that the that our society grows is by manipulating money, then the faster that that happens, that where those jobs are reduced, then you have to manipulate money faster to be able to increase prices of everything else faster. So more and more people are working, more and more people are driving two cars to work, more and more people have two jobs to, to more and more. The entire system is based on manipulating money faster. And so one system's wanting to save your time, which is congruent with the healthy earth, right? Which is which congru congruent with, with making us work less. And the other system relies on on manipulating money so we could grow forever on a finite planet, which, according to physics, is pretty impossible. Exactly. It all comes down to simple maths, yeah. like Greg would say, or simple physics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like the people who have walked across that bridge to the new system, the new parallel society that Bitcoin is, they kind of understand that already. You don't want to buy cheap Chinese, excuse my French, cheap Chinese crap anymore. Because when you understand your money is going to appreciate into the future, you want to actually save it and not just spend it on useless things that you're not going to use in five or 10 years time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that, and, and if you saved it, so that, it, so if you carry that on, some people say, okay, well, the economy wouldn't function if you didn't, uh, um, if you, if pe more people save their money and that's just, it's so not true. So, because mm -hmm. if on the corollary, you'd have to ask, is the only reason people purchase because they're, uh, because there's theft in money and you're forcing them to purchase because their money is being destroyed? Because that's actually what you're saying. If you're saying that people won't purchase things, right? I think I'm going to still purchase food. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> I think I'm going to still purchase things I want. I purchase, uh, I, I, I think. I'm still going to invest in companies that I think could could outperform other companies. All of that won't change one iota um, uh, from from individual decisions which drive the uh, drive the economy in aggregate. Um, they, it, the only change is it's based on truth. It's based on no no theft in money, and then people can make their own decisions on when they are going to spend their money, and they will make their decisions based on spending their money on what makes sense for them to make to spend their money on similar to to you've probably bought a, many TVs in your in your life even though if you just waited and didn't spend any money on TVs you could wait and buy a really big TV for cheaper today right mm. um, but you've probably bought many TVs that have gone um it, th that prices come down doesn't change doesn't make people wait forever it makes them wait to the point that they see value It's a big mental shift. Um, it certainly is. When Because all the Keynesians will throw that propaganda at you when you start talking about a Bitcoin standard and deflationary money. They're like, oh, we're going to enter a, a deflationary death spiral. You can never operate so, on it. A... So, so, so they're right. They're mm -hmm. right. But they're conflating two things. They're conflating a debt collapse, which is inevitable, mm -hmm. right? Deflation. And because the debt collapse, which is inevitable, so so when people talk about debt deflate or uh, that deflation or uh, that happened in the '30s, and it 
it's so profound an impact on society because it's so harsh on society. They don't talk about the manipulation of money and the rise of easy credit in the 20s to be able to get to the 30s. They talk about the 30s like it's an isolated event that that happened. And so that debt collapse, they're just it's just really simple. There is no way to pay back $400 trillion dollars of debt in the world. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. The debt will not be paid back. The only way the debt will be either default or it'll default in some countries, or it'll be it will, you'll have financial repression and you will you'll have high inflation and your real wages won't grow as fast as uh, as the infl- uh, inflation. But the debt the debt will not be repaid, period. So every single thing within the existing system trying to outpace that manipulation of money is making that system stronger. The only thing that protects you is outside of the system. And that's mm-hmm. Bitcoin because it can it could be uh, because nobody can manipulate it. Exactly right. Jeff, we earlier talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and AI is all in the news recently with chat GBT. In your book, I think you spent about two chapters there talking about uh, intelligence and artificial intelligence in particular. Uh, and you kind of, I think from memory, you had a little bit more of an optimistic take on AI and the abundance it can bring us. Are there any concerns or red flags or risks of artificial intelligence that worry you the most? Artificial intelligence from within our existing system will destroy us. And I, when I, what, what I say is, is that is artificial intelligence and robotics are going to merge. And you're going to have smart machines that are smarter eventually. Now, that might be 20 years. It might be 50 years. It might be two years that are going to be smarter than you and smarter than all humanity. If you concentrate all power of a manipulation, that productivity, that productivity gain that should flow to society so you don't have to work, right? And everything moves to almost free and price so you don't have to work or you work two hours a day. First 10 hours a week, then two hours a week, then one hour a week, then 30 minutes a week. If that looked like society from a Bitcoin system, then that productivity wouldn't be being stolen from society and and concentrated up into very few people controlling the AI and everybody else. Otherwise, that artificial intelligence is 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 pulled up to a system of control over everybody else. Now, the problem with that system of control over everybody else is probably before we get there, society goes to war. I mean, global conflict because of that trend consolidating that power. And 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 this is where I'm optimistic in nature. I need to know how bad things are and what things look like at the first at first principles and what that look, looks like and then catapult kind of all the reactions. And I can talk about them without emotion before I make a decision to move to another system. And then, so I can be hopeful while having this conversation. <laughs> but in the existing system, what that means is we quite potentially could end all life on the planet with global conflict on this level of global conflict. We've never we've never reset a, cur- a currency regime when we had nuclear weapons, when nine nations had nuclear weapons and many more competing to get them in uh where we could end all life on this planet. We've never had we, we've never reset a currency regime in this level of technology that we have today. Or if we didn't end all life on this planet, we could go back to dark ages. We could go really t- take a real st- uh, step back. But that artificial intelligence will continue. It will continue to get better and better. It's an exponential trend. You can see what's happened even this year. If you look at what's happened, like just look at GPD, open, open AI, stable diffusion. Look what's happening this year on 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 that. And people are, are asleep at the wheel on on what's what's happening. 99% of companies, I'll bet you right now, and 99% of people within those companies are saying, wow, look at OpenAI. I'm going to make my marketing more efficient. What they're really saying is I'm going to do this better with less people. Right? <laughs> That's what they're saying. And then 0.1% of companies are saying, wait, 
all of those companies exist and all of those people exist. I don't need any of them and I can create a new company. I'm doing something. So I can use exactly the same technology without any of the barrier, without any of the legacy. And I can build a new company with, with this. So, mm -hmm. and, and as, as we use tools like this, it'll get smarter. It'll get better. Mm -hmm. More people will race to where the jobs are and the, the, uh, those jobs. And under a system of manipulated money, then that means all of that productivity gain must be stolen from society. Because what should happen is prices should fall at that rate. But if they fell at that rate, then the existing system that's built on debt would collapse in totality. Yeah. So you need a system like Bitcoin that transfers, because in, in Bitcoin terms, that productivity is moving into Bitcoin. So what's really happening is Bitcoin is is pricing that transition or pricing the existing system collapse slowly and all prices are going to fall forever against Bitcoin. But, and, and what that does is it allows that, that artificial intelligence, that, that power, that, or that general purpose technology that's across every industry to, to, to be for us to benefit rather than a very small group of people benefit. Mm. Bitcoin is hope. Yep. Jeff, before we close this one out, I have had you for nearly an hour and a half now. So I want to try to wrap this one up and be a little bit respectful of your time. But I have to ask you about Twitter. Yeah, I think you wrote a blog post uh, titled Why Every CEO Should Use Twitter over a decade ago. And I think it went semi-viral on Twitter. So what do you think about Elon Musk spending tens of billions of dollars on buying Twitter today? And how has Twitter performed to your expectations of how you thought it might look over 10 or 15 years ago when you wrote that blog post. So I did that just because, because I realized in early, in early network effects growing, mm -hmm. then those network effects need influential people to be able to, to be able to promote the platform and that. And so they promote the influential people. It's win-win. So every early platform, TikTok is the same. Or if you were early on TikTok or you're early on Instagram, you become an influencer later on. So I did the blog post almost as a game to see if I did the blog post as an influencer, would I be put onto Twitter's front page? And that's exactly what happened. So I think Elon made a huge mistake buying buying Twitter. And I don't and and I'm I'm gonna try to um whether you like Elon, dislike Elon, and everything else, I am not a hero worshipper. I think he's gotten over his skis. I think he is really great in a bunch of things, but he's gotten over his skis. And I think he's largely wanting to do the right thing um, in, in, um, in, in Twitter, but it's almost impossible to do the right thing in a system as, as complex as Twitter. It's just a different, now you have a different version of who's controlling the speech, right? And, um, and so it, it, again, it just, it, it just eccentric. That, that's a people problem trying to solve a system problem. And all the while, and all the while, so if you look at what's happening with Noster, notes and other things uh, uh, on, uh, on relays, um, I don't know if you're on it yet, but if you're not, you should be because it's uh, it's an early uh, decentralized Twitter, which I suspect is going to completely replace Twitter. So I think I think Elon made a huge mistake buying that, um, certainly at the price, um, because that price was that price he paid was based on. The U.S. continuing to manipulate money, and then the U.S. stopped, stopped or tightened policy a bit, and everything, everything is breaking loose. So Twitter is a, a debacle right now, and I don't think he's going to get out of it well. Very interesting take on Twitter. I'm going to have to tease that one apart, maybe in another podcast. Jeff, I want to hit you with a couple of rapid fire questions before we close this one out. On a scale of zero to ten. How much fun was traveling in Madeira with Greg Foss? How about a 12? <laughs> yeah. And actually, it wasn't just Greg. Uh, yeah. uh, Larry, Canute, Daniel yeah. Prince, uh, like, uh, the, the, the group of club music, the like the group of the, mm. uh, just such good people. Uh, Obi was there, just such good people. I'm definitely going to have to check it out shortly. And yeah. final little rapid fire question. Do you think we're living in a simulation? Uh, just that, hey? um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, uh, I, I think our mind creates the simulation. 
So mm-hmm. each of our minds. So I, I think I, I think there, our reality is is literally a mirror of our uh, of what w- our beliefs are, our beliefs and actions are. And if uh, if you don't like that reality, you can change that, that reality. But very few of us believe that we are in control of changing that reality. But it's as simple as that. And then we live in a shared reality of those thoughts and beliefs, thoughts, actions, and uh, the beliefs, thoughts, and actions. So I think it's just. Uh, if if, the, if that's the simulation, the simula- simulation is our mind. I think that's a great note to end things on today, Jeff. I want to thank you one more time for coming on the podcast. Um, I really do mean it when I say your work has had a tremendous impact on how I see the world and technology and Bitcoin. So thank you so much for everything you do. I really, really appreciate it. And is there any final comments or is there any uh, maybe tips or tricks you could give a young a uh, person who could be worried about AI um, or you've obviously built a number of successful businesses. Are there any uh, simple tips or tricks or advice that you would leave the listener with um, today? Spend time, spend time, Wayne Gretzky quote, um, mm-hmm. I skate to where the puck is going, right? The uh, uh, spend time, uh, spend your time moving to where the puck is going. And the puck, the puck is going into in Bitcoin is going into decentralization. If so, if you understand these systems and what's being built on top, you're going and spend a lot more time around those ecosystems. You're going to be spending your time with a whole bunch of people building the future, and you're going to find a whole bunch of opportunity inside that that future. And 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 that's the asymmetric bet. It's a bet on yourself, because all it takes is learning before a whole bunch of other people into this and all of the same things are going to be required. Like a bunch of these companies are going to need marketing. They're going to need, they're going to need sales. They're going to need, uh, um, how do we grow this business? They're going to need uh, lead, leadership. So as you, as you start to understand what's happening in this kind of new build, um, there's, there's just, there's so an immense amount of opportunity um, in that spot. So, I would say if I was, uh, if I was younger, if I, I'm doing it older, but if I was younger, that's where I would be. I'd be spending all my time really learning what this looks like and where this goes and starting meeting some of the, some of the builders within it. It's sound advice. Uh, Jeff, top three book recommendations. Oh, this is the hardest thing. I, so I, I, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't every time I, every, um, uh, here, here's one that I, uh, just finished and I reread it and it's just, it's just a really great book, power versus force. So, uh, so, so there's, cause that's on my, uh, I've been thinking of a lot about it right, uh, right now. So take, take a read of that. Done. I'm going to download that one as soon as I get off this call with you. Uh, Jeff, I want to thank you once again for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for everything you're doing for the Bitcoin space and just trying to make the world a better place. Uh, where can the listeners find you today? Uh, best, actually, uh, probably now on Noster, but uh, but uh, mm-hmm. but uh, Jeff Booth on Noster, uh, Jeff Booth or Noster Verified on uh, Noster or uh, uh, at Jeff Booth on Twitter. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you all have a good day. Thanks. You too. There you have it. That's my conversation with the one and the only Jeff Booth. I really do hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe to the channel and slap a like on the video. We really do appreciate that. And final little reminder, this episode actually aired over on the Coinbeast YouTube channel a couple of weeks before I released it on here. So anyone who missed the memo, I am managing the social media account for Coinbeast and I am managing their YouTube channel. So if you want to stay up to date with all the interviews I drop, make sure you head on over to Coinbeast and subscribe to that channel so you're notified when my interviews go live. As soon as they go live, Later on, I might post the same interviews over on this channel a couple of weeks after the fact, but Coinbeast is where it's at. And that's all I've got for you guys today. Uh, Thanks again to today's show sponsors, Hodling Apparel, the Bitbox O2 hardware wallet, and of course, Amber, the only place I'm using to buy my Bitcoin. Highly recommend you check out all the sponsors. Links will be in the description. And that's all I've got. I hope you guys have a good day, and I'll see you all in the next episode.